Today I'm making a bedside table out of a rock and a really gnarly piece of walnut root. I've been really into these rock and wood combinations lately, and what's cool about this project is that I got both pieces of material for free. Well, they did take a lot of work. Let's start with the walnut root. It's under this stump, which is in my parents' backyard, and every time over the last few years when Jesse and I would visit, we would work a little bit more on the stump. Of course we could have just cut the stump off and then ground it down and called it a day, but that's just not the way my family likes to do things. My dad was really insistent on getting as much of the roots out as possible, and so we would slowly dig away at it and then cut away pieces of the rather substantial root infrastructure. Digging is really hard work. Digging when roots are constantly in your way so you can't get full shovelfuls is really, really hard work. Honestly, there's no way I would have gone to this much trouble if it was just me. But after Thanksgiving dinners or Christmas brunches, Jesse and I would go into the backyard and put in a few hours on the stump. The roots were sending up sprouts throughout my parents' garden, so my dad really wanted to get rid of them. So whenever possible, I would use the axe to chop away a piece. These smaller pieces weren't really wood. They were super wet and just very fibrous. So it was pretty easy and satisfying to just chop away with the axe. Every time I removed a chunk of root, Jesse could go in and scrape away dirt and excavate a little bit deeper. A reciprocating saw with a pruning blade was pretty handy, and I recommend this because when you're cutting roots, there's a lot of dirt embedded into the wood matter itself, so I was really doling up my chainsaw blade whenever I used it. I've been sharing updates about the stump on my Instagram whenever I'm up there, and one of the questions people ask is, why don't we just pull it out? Well, if you see there's a fence right behind it, and my dad's afraid that it's going to mess up the foundation. I finally exposed a piece that was big enough for a project. So I sliced in between it and the stump and then cut some of the roots that were holding it up and going down into the ground. This ball of roots weighed about 75 pounds. Removing it though really opened up one of the big side roots that was going deep into the yard. And this one I just severed with the ax. This piece was even heavier and weighed about 130 pounds, so I set both pieces off to the side so that they could dry in the nice California sun. I trimmed the big piece down a little bit more, and after drying out for seven months, the weight was greatly reduced. But that drying process did result in quite a few cracks. Now I'm ready to haul these treasures all the way back to Joshua Tree in my brand new 2025 Subaru Forester. Subaru is the sponsor for this video, and I thought this was the perfect project because the theme is all about a circle of trust. This really resonated with me because I keep my team small and it only includes family or friends that are just as close. My work involves a lot of random adventures, and the objectives and outcomes aren't always clear. Jesse, my sister, and business partner as well as Shane, my camera guy, are in my circle of trust because I know while they may not understand exactly how the project we're working on is gonna come out, they're gonna be good sports and show a lot of patience while we figure it out. We took the Forester out to the construction site for the Reset Hotel, it's 180 acres, and we were on a mission to find a rock that would go really well with the root ball. It was over 100 degrees, so we really appreciated the excellent climate control within the Forester, and we sort of used it as a mobile HQ where we could launch our drone to look for rocks, and when we saw a promising one, we would zip on over to grab it. The symmetrical all-wheel drive did fantastic on the rough terrain of Joshua Tree, and this is by far the most luxurious and comfortable car I've ever had. These rocks are pretty heavy, so I took advantage of the backup cameras so I could get really close to them, pop open the hatch, and then load in the stones. We thought about breaking down the stones here in the field to reduce the weight, but we thought let's give our new trusty Subaru a challenge. We can even switch the rearview mirror to a camera and screen mode, which gives you excellent visibility when you're backing up. I really like this combination of a roomy interior where I can move and store lots of people or stuff, while still being in a vehicle that handles really tightly and has a nice amount of pep. The Forester has a completely redesigned exterior that balances a tough SUV design with sophisticated touches including modern elements like a bold new grill, trim accents, and muscular design contours. Plenty of room for passengers and cargo, and the split back seats allow for maximum versatility for all kinds of cargo. The electronic interface with your phone feels very modern and easy to navigate, 
and I find the cup holder placement quite ideal. We had a really productive day collecting rocks. Now I'm ready to get to the building. So now that I have a few different rocks that I can use as a base, I started taking a closer look at this ball of roots. This is so different than any other piece of wood that I've worked with before because these roots sort of twisted together and then merged into this solid or semi-solid nest. So I took my 14 inch chainsaw and just started removing the outer layer, which was a little bit rotted and crumbly and had kind of the root equivalent of bark on it. The idea I have in mind is for dark wood to be sort of a rough mirror image of the lighter colored rock. So I want to keep as much of the wood intact while removing the pieces that are a little too soft or just seem to be disintegrating. I saw that some of these gnarly crevices were deeper than I initially expected and in one case they actually connected to form a little bit of a tunnel. The moisture in this bowl was also really inconsistent. The yellowish part was significantly wetter than the hard dry brown parts. The chainsaw got me to this mostly solid kind of faceted chunk. So now I'm going to go with the angle grinder and try to turn some of these crevices into design features. And I'm basically going to try to scoop them out, get all that rough, barky dirt out of them. And in doing so, start to bring curved surfaces to these flat sides. The dark parts of the wood are incredibly hard. And I think walnut root is actually used for gun stocks in some cases. When I started grinding at this linear crevice, I saw some sparks fly from the angle grinder. And so I pried this dirt out and saw that there was actually little pebbles in it. There was even a pretty good sized rock that the roots had grown around and it was actually set into the wood the way kind of a jeweler would set a diamond into a gold band. This was pretty satisfying and I got a free rock. The piece was starting to take shape and I had exposed some wet surfaces. So I let it dry and uh, even hotter son of Joshua Tree for a couple days. I use this time to brainstorm and come up with an approach to finalize the form and design. All right, so you see right here, I got this sort of knot hole and a crack right here. So my carving strategy is to slowly scoop these out. That way I'm getting closer to the bottom of these holes, but still keeping the maximum amount of kind of outward volume. I want this thing to feel big, but I want the surface really articulated. So I'm actually using the cracks and holes as a guide for where to carve. So you see this blonde wood right here, that's the sapwood and it's, it's still the part that isn't fully cured. It's kind of wet still. And so when I'm grinding it, this part is real smooth and firm and hard. This part is just a little bit furry. So this is gonna be the trickier part to finish because when I sand this, this might want to stay just a little bit wet and hairy. So this gash is pretty deep. And in order to really get this all the way out, I basically would have to obliterate this whole wall. So I think I'm gonna leave a little bit of that kind of gnarly and I'll just have to hand sand that. In general, I want to get these curves broad enough and not so tight that I can get the orbital sander in there to sand things out. Otherwise, it's a lot of hand sanding with a very hard, knotty wood. The spiky carving disc on my angle grinder is four and a half inches in diameter. This is great because my orbital sander has a five inch diameter on the sanding pad. So I know if, if I can really reach these curved surfaces with the angle grinder with a little room to spare, I should be able to sand it with the orbital sander without having too much trouble. Although I did do a little touch up with the chainsaw. Angle grinders and chainsaws are pretty aggressive tools. And it only took me about two and a half to three hours to go from the rough root ball to the finished shape that just needed some sanding. We picked up over a thousand pounds of rocks on our trip, but this piece best matches the aesthetic of the roots. It's mostly white with dark swirls, whereas the root ball is dark with lighter colored wood swirls. It's also not as oval as some of the other rocks that we found, and it looks like that kind of pointy part on one side could fit into one of the natural crevices in the root ball. A lot of my rock pieces start with flattening out the bottom of the stone. I typically just draw a line with a sharpie and then take my angle grinder with a tile cutting blade and just start scoring along that line. Once I have this initial line, I can just come in from the other side and not necessarily cut the piece free, but just cut it close enough where I can chip it away with a hammer. 
And this is the basic process for removal. Now, if I had a huge stone saw, I could just, you know, make one clean slice, but I don't have room for that. And uh, I think they're also pretty expensive. This method is incremental. And I've even put these linear stone chips through my rock tumblers and I get really cool kind of long, thin pieces of smooth stone out of them. I've gotten a lot of comments saying how tedious this seems, but it only took me about an hour to rough out the bottom to a mostly flat surface. And then from here, I can switch grinding discs and bring it to just a little bit more level. Now, in a recent project, I discovered that I can get a perfectly flat bottom, not by grinding, which is, you know, difficult and requires a lot of skill and, and patience, but by getting it mostly flat, then laying a silicone mat down on a flat surface and using quickrete anchoring epoxy to negotiate between the mostly flat surface of the rock and the flat laid out silicone mat. This anchoring epoxy will stick incredibly strongly to the rock, but won't stick at all to the silicone. The epoxy only takes about four hours to cure, and now I can start thinking about how to connect the two pieces. So I found a point where it balances onto the rock, and there's kind of a crevice that still has some bark in it, coming through there but let's see if we can make it fit a little bit better so oh yeah if you look right in here but first i like this location so i'm just going to mark where i'm at but actually let me get some tape that'll be clearer okay and let's see this way it'll be easy to keep realigning it to the same location while i slowly carve away okay so it's sort of sitting on the peak of the rock but it looks like I can take away a little here. There. Angle grinding wood indoors creates a lot of dust, but luckily I trust Shane to have a steady hand with the shop back. Oh yeah, that's a little better. So now that I have more stability, I can refine my alignment. Just make a mark on the blue tape. And we're ready to drill some holes. Now I'm going to go up to a bigger drill bit. And now I can put my metal socket, which is just a piece of pipe, right in there. And then this pin will go into the rock. I'm gonna seal off the end of this pipe so epoxy doesn't get into here. I could use the quickrete anchoring epoxy here. It does pretty well with wood to metal, even though that's not what it's intended for. But I prefer for wood, where the hole diameter is a little closer to the metal pipe, to use a thinner epoxy. I just feel like with the thicker stuff and these tight of parameters, I'd get some air bubbles. Once the epoxy had cured, I inserted the metal rod so that when I placed the piece of wood, the metal rod would slide out and hit where I need to drill a hole in the rock. I traced that outline with a sharpie, and then I used my angle grinder with a core drilling bit to drill the hole. Core drilling bits are hollow, and they leave a little stone nub in the bottom of the hole, or sometimes it just breaks off and gets stuck within the bit itself. But in either case, if you do have a little bit of that stone nub, you just use a screwdriver to snap it off. Now I can use the anchoring epoxy in the stone hole and insert the metal rod. Because the wood can balance in mostly its correct position, I can actually use the wood piece to hold the rod in the right place while that anchoring epoxy cures. Now carving out that notch in the wood so that it would fit perfectly onto the stone and at the same time have a perfectly level top is, well, a little beyond my skill set. So instead, I'm going to level the wood now that I know its final position. And I just made a quick jig out of scrap that has allowed me to use my very small palm router and just slide back and forth across the top and then slowly pull out those little shims that I put underneath this contraption so I can slowly decrease the height and work my way down to a level surface. And when I saw how many cracks were deep into this piece of wood, I was really happy that I didn't try to slab this up. Oh, I figured it was time to move the rock off the silicone and look, perfectly flat bottom, thanks to the anchoring epoxy. This feels like a hard plastic and I kind of like it because it doesn't really scratch floors. I started with 60 grit sandpaper on my orbital sander to smooth out the marks from the palm router. 
I then added a sanding sponge in between the sandpaper and the tool so that I could do nice contour sanding up to 220 grit around all the curved surfaces. I placed the piece just to get a sense of how everything was looking and then I got on my dental tools, yeah, I got dental tools, and I used them to kind of pick through all the cracks and, and get out any debris or little loose pieces of wood fiber. This may seem tedious, but I actually find it quite satisfying. I was kind of torn on how I wanted to approach the finish of this piece. I ended up using Simple Finish, which is an oil and wax finish, because I think this wood is still going to move and dry a little bit more. And so I wanted to provide some protection, but keep it mostly natural. So if some of the grain rises as the wood dries or develops more cracks, I can just buff out those areas and add another coat of oil. Also, aesthetically, part of what I like about this particular piece of wood is not how perfect it is, it's how gnarly it is. I mean, there's some really dramatic things happening here. And don't even get me started on filling all these cracks with epoxy. No thank you. I mean, you could if you wanted to. I just don't think it adds that much. And I've done it before, it can be great. But if anything, I would add in melted metal like I've done in some previous projects. And lastly, thanks to Subaru for sponsoring this project and another one that's coming soon in the future. I put a lot of trust in my team and my tools and it's been great to add the Subaru Forester to that circle. It's serving as trusty transportation to get me, Shane, and Jesse safely and comfortably around on our making adventures. Also, really great cup holder placement and the tech stuff works really well with my phone. Okay, thanks, bye.